Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Akif. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about me in the middle. So, so to, to start off, uh, I'm going to give some sort of an a, sort of an example problem, a motivating example. Um, okay, and it's basically the knapsack problem. So you have n numbers, and here n is around forty. Um, and these numbers are really really big. They can be around like one, uh, ten to the seventeen. Okay. And you're given some other number, s, which is also in that same range, around 10 to the 17th or 10 to the 18th. Um, and you want to know, can you pick a subset of your n numbers, of your ai's, such that they sum up to exactly s? Uh, normally, for CP, when you do a knapsack problem, you have this dp, where it goes, where you keep track of all the sums that are possible, all the way up to your maximal possible sum. And you just keep on throwing numbers onto it as you, uh, 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 for each number in your array. Right? And you see, you see what numbers you can make. Uh, however, that only works if the maximal possible sum is sufficiently small. Uh, here, it's not, right? As I said before, s can be 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18, right? So we can't do this dp. Okay? Um, so uh, first, I'm just going to give the naive solution, um, just so you guys fully understand what the problem is and see what's happening. Um, and that's just to brute force and try all possible subsets. Right. So you want to try all possible subsets of our n numbers. Uh, there's two to the n such subsets. And for each of the subsets, we can just loop through it and sum it up uh, and compare it against s. Right? Uh, and to actually do this checking, we can use bitmask. Uh, so you can see the code on the right for, for this. We do the, we look, loop over all mass from 0 up to 2 to the n. From 0 up to 2 to the n. Um, and for each mask, if that bit is set, Right, the, the ith bit is set. We take ai, um, and then we check finally if the sum is equal to s. Right? If it is, then we we're good. And if we never find anything, then we're bad. Right. Um, however, uh, as I said before, this, there are two to the n such possible subsets. So this time complexity for this is going to be n times two to the n. Um, and for forty, two to the n is way too big. It's like what is that? That's a, a trillion, right? That's, that's, that's yeah. Two to the forty is a trillion. That's way too slow. Though. Okay, so this naive solution doesn't work when, once we hit like n equals forty. Um, so here's the. So now I'm gonna sort of. Oh wait, before that, does everyone understand the problem and uh, what, what the naive solution is doing? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, now let's move on to the actual solution. Oh wait, someone. So for the actual solution, what you want to do is think about splitting your list into sort of two halves, OK? So we're going to get all the possible bit masks, all, like, all possible subsets for the first, first 20 items, right? Just the first 20 items and do the naive code for that uh, from, from the last slide. Uh, then we want to do the same thing for the right of the right 20 bits, right, right 20 items, right? So we pick uh, the, the second half of, of the 20 items and, and then do the naive code for that, OK? Um, so when we do the naive code for the left half, what we're going to do is each each sort of iteration of each bit mask, right, of the naive code um, will give us um, a mask, obviously, but it'll also give us a sum, which corresponds to that subset. For that subset, what is the sum of the items in the subset? And so we get these pairs for that. What we want to do is you want to sort them. And you want to sort them by their sum of that, of that subset, OK? Then when we run that bit mask brute force code for the right half here, OK, that also give us like a pair like this, right? Um, but what you want to do now is use for the right half is instead of storing that somewhere and sorting it, we're going to do is going to bind research in the left half for your right half. Bit. So for a given sum on the right half, right? Let's say you have some sum on the right half, uh, some sum x. Um, on on the left side, you want the sum s minus x for for the whole thing to work out for the left and right pair to work out. You want some element on the left with some s minus x. For your element on the right with sum x. Okay, so uh, you take the current bit mask sum x for this right element guy, right element subset. And you do s minus that, and then you binary search on the list on the on the uh, list to the towards uh, on the list core for the left elements, left half, left half elements, right? Um, and if you get a hit, right? If you get some uh, element on the left that has s minus x where you have x, um, then you can concatenate the two bit mask. Right, you take the bit mask for the, for the left items, the bit mask for the right items. So it's just like you needing the two subsets basically, right? Um, and so in terms of time complexity for this, right? Um, 
the sorting and searching part, right, takes uh, two to the n over two because this n over two elements we're working on, right, at the same time. So the sorting and searching takes this long, um, and then actually constructing the the subset is n times two to the n over two, right, because uh, for each mask, you have to loop through it and do it. Right? Uh, however, a nice trick here is that log of 2 to the n over 2 is just the n over 2 comes down. Then it comes n over 2 times log 2, which is a constant again. So the entire running time is just um, n times 2 to the n over 2. Um, and here, uh, n over 2 is like 20. So now we have 20 times 2 to the 20, which is like 20 million, which is completely fine. Runs uh, much less than a second, as opposed to the trillion operations we um, so we've sort of cut the running time down in square, uh, to the square root of what it was before. OK. Um, I'll show you the implementation real quick now, and, and then I guess I'll wait for questions. So hopefully the implementation will clear up any sort of uh, questions you have. Maybe. OK. Um, so, here, so first we look at n, and we divide it into a left half and a right half. Uh, the reason I can't just do over 2 is because you might have odd and even cases, so I'd like to specifically. Uh, explicitly make the left and right, uh, so they add up to n. Um, <clears throat> as, I said before, as I said before, we do the whole naive brute force thing for the uh, left half. Um, then we, as we did exactly as we did before, we loop through for the left half items. And if we have the n our subset, we add it to our current sum. And then we say, OK, for these left half items, we have the option of taking this sum for, and that corresponds to this mask, this subset of items. And then we sort it by their sum. Um, and then now we go and do the naive brute force solution for the right half here. Um, and same thing here. We loop through the, those items and take them and, and add into their sum. Except here, we're not adding it to our sum. We're subtracting it from our desired sum. So we say, at the end of the day, we want to have the sum equal s. right? And sort of each item we take saves us AI away from that. Right? So we subtract it out. Um, and then we binary search in our left item for that re remaining sum. So we say, oh, this much of it is remaining, and we binary search using lower bound. Um, and if that thing exists, and it's, if the item exists, that's all this check is doing, um, then, we, then our answer is going to be uh, the left mask, the subset from the left, and we shift it, right, so we can concatenate. So we take the left and shift it, and then put the right where the left where that thing was. And then we, we uh, or it with the current mask for the right half. And that's our answer. Um, and if there is no answer, then you just put negative one or whatever. Right? OK. Uh, any questions or things that are things that are confusing? No? OK. Oh, uh, move on. OK. So that was the example problem. Um, but most meet in the middle sort of uh, problems or, or, or solutions follow the same basic pattern as that uh, solution. The idea is when you're trying to like very some sort of brute forcey uh, approach, and that brute force approach is like just too slow, right? So um, what you can do, the idea with meet in the middle is maybe you can cut your input for that uh, brute force solution into half. And then you run the brute force solution on each half independently. Um, then you can try to reconcile the two halves, the two sort of results of the brute force solutions. Um, and the hope is that using some sort of data structure algorithm, you can reconcile these two halves in less than n squared time. Um, and in this case, not, be, not being the original n, but in this case, when I say n, I mean the size of the brute force solution, uh, the, 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 the return value from the brute force solution, whatever that is. Um, and so if you sort of reconcile, sort of reconcile those two halves in subquadratic time, um, you'll have saved some time over your original before solution. Um, in the last uh, example problem, right, um, this sort of data structure algorithm was sorting and then binding searching, right? So that was n lock n, right, that solution. So then the final thing became your brute force result, which is 2 to the n over 2, right, or square root of 2 to the n, and then that times log in itself. Um, and that was fast enough. In that case. Okay. Everyone see how this applies to what we did before? Yep. Yeah, so that's pretty much it for like actual material, I think. Um, 
from now for, for, for the rest of it, I'm just going to be teaching, just doing a bunch of problems, uh, just so you guys get familiar with the way of thinking for me in the middle. Um, and yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this first problem sort of is similar to the uh, last one and builds off of that, I think. Um, so we have two people, Alice and Bob, and they work at a museum. Okay. And uh, for this uh, week, there's 20 shifts at the museum, okay? Um, and N is going to be less than around, uh, yeah, so there's N shifts where N is less than 20. Right? And at each shift, at least one person must work. So either Alice can work that shift, either Bob can work that shift, or maybe both can work that shift, okay? Um, and Alice and Bob, they like working at the museum uh, because uh, they like history. Um, so they gain some amount of happiness every time they work at the museum, every time they work some shift. Okay. Um, so for the ith shift, Alice gains some AI happiness if she works. Okay? And AI is maybe some big number like uh, here, 10 to the 15. Um, and for that shift, if Bob works, he gains a BI happiness for the ith shift. Okay. Um, and the question you want to we were asking, can you, can you see the can you see the bottom? Okay. The question we're asking is. Um, how many ways are there for both guards to get at least age happiness? So you have to figure out some sort of assignment of people to the shift. So for the first shift, either Alice, Bob, or both. For the second shift, uh, do some other configuration. For the third shift, do some other configuration. So in totality, across all shifts, uh, how many different ways are there um, under the condition that the total happiness across the entire week um, must be at least age for both Alice and Bob? Okay. Everyone get the problem? And I, I guess we'll leave it a couple minutes to think about it. Wait, so, oh, so the sum of the happinesses of the guards has to be at least H. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 not, not the sum of the happiness. Like, like, sorry, sum of the happiness for Alice I must be greater than equal to H. And separately, the sum of the happiness for Bob has to be greater than equal to H. Wait, then can't you just do them separately? Uh, how? Well, well they're, they're, they're not independent, right? Because if Alice doesn't work, then Bob has to work. Right? And vice versa. Oh, you're right, yeah. If you guys come up with the brute force solution, right? And then we can analyze that first. Well, the brute force solution would be it would be three to the n because you would yeah. choose either one, one of them or both of them. Exactly. Um, so uh, just, we can't do a normal two to the n bit math because there's three options here, not just Alice and Bob, but also both. Um, so we just like we can do like a base three bit math where instead of doing shifts, we can multiply by three and divide by three and mod by three. Um, but so the brute force would then be three to the n. Um, but for n equals twenty, this is around uh, five e nine. Exactly, 3.5 e9 here. So that's not fast enough. What are the bounds on A and B? You're muted. They're, they're really big. Though. They're like 10 to the 15. Okay. Right, 
right? So this is the meet in the middle presentation, right? So think about if you like break the input in half, right? And then do the brute force separately. Um, what what happens then, right? What how does like the reconciliation part look like? The, the, the meeting in the middle part looks like. That that's where the name comes from. So we like divide n by two. So we do like ten shifts and then another ten shifts. Right. right yeah. Um, we find like uh, all the sum and on like um, um, either do the sum for both both the halves or like you should like do something really similar to like the first problem, where we're yeah, sorting so, across all the shifts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, let me show you. You basically the next slide, I think. So we're gonna split the input into the left half and the right half, right? Um, and we do all list all possible options across all n over two days, right? So all three to the ten options on the left half, all three to the options on the right half, right? And we get this sort of happiness sum pair, like exactly like you said for each. So we get Alice's happiness for those ten shifts and Bob's happiness for those ten shifts. Right? Um, and now the question comes: How do we merge these two? Right? So we have these ten, uh, three to the ten pairs on the left side and three to the ten, pair, ten pairs on the right side. Um, so, for, so for the constraint for merging, unlike, unlike last time, right? So remember last problem, the constraint for merging was that you have this x on the left and this x on the right, and you need x on the left plus x to the right has to sum up to s, right? where s is in our input s, right? Here, the constraint is slightly different. So here, if you're given a pair al, bl on the left and a pair a, b, r on the right, you need al plus ar has to be at least h, and bl plus br has to be at least h, right? Okay, this is really stupid, but uh, 2D secretary? Um, not 2D secretary, but uh, you have half the solution, I think. Uh, I, I guess I'll just give it. It's not, uh, I don't think we've like covered much of uh, this of sweep, uh, of sweep line before. So let's, let me just, uh, just guess, give you guys the answer for now. Um, so um, as you kind of sort of, uh, I guess, implying there, um, you can think of the right half points as a query, right? Um, so you want to think as to look at on this picture, uh, the, the red guys are the left hand points, right? So I graph a comma b, it's like x comma y, uh, for the red guys, which are the left points, the left pairs. Um, and then these blue points are the right pairs, okay? Um, except not really. So in, instead of just looking at the right pairs directly, uh, we want to instead think about them as a query for how, what, how many points are above and to the right of me, um, but not of me, but h minus me. Right. So you want to look at h minus ar and h minus br and say, okay, how many points are the right and to the above, both right and above, right? Because if they're both right and both above me, then h minus ar plus that uh, al has to be at least h, right? And then at least h minus br plus br has to be at least h. Right. You see this, so the blue points here are me graphing h minus ar and h minus comma h minus br for all these. Uh, right pairs and the red points of the left pairs just as, as it is. Does everyone understand this picture and what we're trying to solve now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, how we actually solve this is we don't need an actual 2D secretary. We can actually just do this with a 1D secretary. And the technique for that is called sweep line. I think we might have like got over this briefly in the actual secretary lecture, but I don't think we went over it much step. Okay. So, let me explain how, how this actually works. So. We're going to take all the queries and points right, and take them both and sort them all by the x coordinate. Okay? So it's like we put them both into one list and then sort them by x coordinate. Okay? Um, then we loop over all the x coordinate values backwards from, left, from right to left, from bigger to smaller. Okay? And then we maintain a sec tree, like a normal 1D sec tree, of the y value of all the, of this y value, okay? Of all the points. Okay? Um, and so as, since we're looping through from right to left, um, at any position, uh, like any, so like halfway through our, through our, through our loop, this secretary will only contain points to the right, okay? Because we haven't got to the points to the left, 
So, so wherever we are at our current loop, we'll only be looking at the points to the right. Okay. So, uh, and this actually will store this to Y value. Um, and since these Y values are really big, remember like 10 to 15, we'll need to do something called coordinate compression just to store them in the set tree properly. So coordinate compression just means we're going to look at all the y, y values we ever encounter. And then since we only care about their order, right, not their absolute magnitude, only just their relative ordering with each other, we can just replace them by their relative ordering. Basically. So if you have these, a bunch of points, the smallest one gets value 0, second smallest one gets value 1, third smallest one gets value 3, so on. Even if these values are in the millions or billions or trillions, their relative ordering only gets us down to sort of n or like 2n um, numbers. So that, that's what coordinate compression does. And we can just sort, basically just sort them and replace them by the indices in a sorted case. It's very easy to do. Okay, so after we do that, right, and as I said before, we can loop from the right to the left. So uh, when we see this, uh, when you see this blue guy, okay, um, uh, or I guess we'll ignore that. So let me show for, for, for the red guys, for the, for the points themselves. And we see the first, we see this point, right? As we loop from right to left, we see this point on the right, this red guy. Um, and so we add this red guy's y value to our sec tree. Then next, we'll see this guy and we'll add him to our sec tree. And then we'll see this guy and we'll add him to our sec tree, okay? Um, now, how do we handle the actual query? So we get a query, okay? Um, we know that uh, since we've sorted by x, we're only looking at red points to the right of it. We're not looking at any red points to the left of it because we just haven't got there yet. And then when we do that, then we just use our sec tree, our 1D sec tree, to search for the y coordinates above my y coordinates. So well, let, let, let me run through the example here. Um, so, first, as we loop from right to left, we'll say hit this blue point. Um, and we'll do a query uh, for above, but it'll be empty because there just aren't any red points in our sec tree yet. Okay, that's, okay so that happens. Uh, then we loop, continue looping, and we see, ah, we see this red point. And then we add its y value to the sec tree. Then we continue looping, ah, we add this y value to the sec tree, and this y value to the sec tree. Then we see this blue point. Okay, so this blue point means, okay, we have the query now. Um, and so notice the red, the, the sec tree only has these, these three points, only the points to the right, so with y value, x value greater than this. Um, then we query in the sec tree for the, for the y value greater than this blue guy's y value. Which again, remember, is like h minus the actual one, but we just we, just, we graph the actual query query point. So then we we look up, and then when we query up, we get the guys who are have a y value bigger than me, and we already know that they have x value bigger than me. So that's exactly the points that we care about. Um, and the sec tree will just return the total number. So when I say we'll put them in a sec tree, I mean we'll just like we'll look at its y value and do that position plus equals one in the sec tree. And then here we'll do a sec tree like sum query for y values from here up to infinity, up to the max n. And I'll just sum up all the, how many other points there are above me. Um, and again, obviously the right of me, because that's how the loop is. And then continue going, oh, now we'll see this red point and add their y value. Then we'll see this blue point, and we'll be like, oh, OK, again, we only see the points to the right of me. And then we're going to do sec sec tree sum query for here this y point up to infinity, up to max n. And it'll get all these points, because they're all above me and to the right of me. Unlike this one, where these points were not above me, but only these points were. And we keep on going at these points and query and just gets everything, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, any questions on how what, what how this is working? So, so the reason we're going from the right is because we're trying to look at a point like that's um to to like from like um because we're looking like on top right corner essentially. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. Uh, you. Uh, I, I just arbitrarily pick y to be the sec tree dimension. So that's querying just in the sec tree, and then. For the other dimension, the x dimension, where we want the values to be bigger than our query values, right? So it's like you said, top right. I got you. Okay. Uh, and so, by the way, in time complexity for this is similar as the last problem. It's three to the end this time, three n times log three to the n. A log comes from the sec tree and the sorting. Um, but again, the, the n sort of drops in the front of the log, so it becomes n log to the n. Wait, wait, what? N log three to the n? Yeah. Oh, wait, that's just wrong. Uh, that's just wrong. Uh, you're right. Uh, it's three. It's n three to the n. I don't know where that happened. My bad. All six seven. I think this seems kind of hard, though. Yeah, it is. The code is becomes quite involved, uh, especially when you all like add the coordinate compression stuff. It's like a whole bunch of steps. You write the function to the brute force, and then 
once you get those values, you make the query values and the, the other values, and then you coordinate compress that. And you also need a text tree. So it is you a lot. Of like 200 lines, right? Yeah, I have like 150 lines. Yeah. I don't have the code in this presentation just because of how involved it is. There's no point going over all the details. But uh, if you want to see it, I can show it to you at some point, or like uh, look at the editorial. It's like I look at like I don't look at mine. Actually, look at like uh, I'll send. I'll put the link I think in the presentation, then you guys can go and see like the top scores code. I'm sure it's better than mine. Um, but by after this, we have a question which has very very short code. It should be nice, I guess. So I guess if no one has any more questions, I'll move on. Okay, uh, keep on going. Okay. Uh, the next problem is called make them similar. I think it's from an add around. Um, so you're given n numbers here, and n is like 100. These numbers are like less than 10 to the 9th. Specifically, they said 2 to 30. It's not less than equal to Joe, I think, by the way. It's like less, less than specifically. It's less than equal to 30 minus 1. Okay, uh, okay but anyway, yeah. So it's specifically, I think it's actually just less than 2 to 30. Um, Okay, but we want to choose some, in so uh, when, if you choose some integer x, we define this operation, which lets us construct the second array, bi, instead of ai, construct the array b, where it's just the XOR of x with all the numbers in a. Okay, so, so for any number x you pick, you can just pick a number x, and then now XOR that across with a, and that gets a new array b, okay? Um, and we want uh, to pick an element x such that this b will have the same pop count across all its elements. So if you look at some element in B and count the number of one bits in that, that should be the same across all elements in B. Um, so that's not going to be true for the array A, but we want to hope to pick some element X, um, such that when you do that, the array, resulting array B will have this nice condition. Yeah. And, and the problem, I think, called this condition of like having the same pop count similarity. That's what it means. They just say, like, oh, the array is similar. And so you want to find some X such that it makes the array, resulting array B similar. Okay. As a pretty close example, uh, here we have an array 3, 17, 6, and 0. Um, these first three elements all have pop count 2, but this last element doesn't. Right? They, they have different pop counts. It's not a similar array. Um, but if you pick x equals 5, um, you get that you get this b array of 6, 20, 3, and 5 after just zoring 3s or 5, 17 or 5, 6 or 5, and 0 or 5. Um, and then if you look at the binary representation, they all have two set bits. And that's a similar array, and that's good. So, so for the problem, you want to either find there is no x, in which case just print negative 1, or if there is an x, just find any such x that works and print that x. OK? Um, could you split it into two to the fifteenth? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. Yeah, you, you want yeah, that? That's the, the sort of it. you want to split not based on n, but you want to split based on the actual max AI. And you, you kind of like you test out all possible x's, so that's like two to the fifteenth on one half. And you store that in some like hash map or something, or some map or something. Um, and then you do the other half, and then you 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 pick like some number between one and thirty, and then you try to find it, like find such that all the bits, such that pop count is equal to that number. Yeah, that, that's exactly correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's go over it again with uh, David said. Um, so if there's too many x's to choose from, so you just try all of the x's. So you want the left, right, and left and right 15 bits independently. This is the x to the left half of L of x and the right half of x. Um, and we're gonna iterate iterate over all possible pop counts for the final answer, right? So b can have like the final answer for b can be like oh two bits drawn for everything, or three bits drawn, or all the way up to 30, right? 
I'm, I'm gonna call that P from now on. Um, um, so for each possible XL, right? So out of all the two to the 15 XLs, uh, you wanna store the B array, um, where here B is not the full B, like full actual B, but it's uh, the pop count of just the left half of A, again, the left 15 halves of A, um, zored with the left 15 halves of, uh, of, X, F, of the X you're trying, right? So you're, you're trying 15 bits for X and you, you zor the two. And then you see, okay, what, what, what pop count will that give me? Um, so you do the same thing with the right half, right? Except this time, instead of storing it in the hash table, you, uh, you sort of want to search on it. So um, you construct this array B, again, where B is this pop count of the right half of X that you're searching, that you're like looping through, and then with the right half of that A value, of the current AI, um, but here you you don't uh, you, you don't want that actual value. You want your p minus that because if you want at the final position, you want like oh b should have at the end uh, I don't know ten bits on right set uh, at, at the end, and you say okay here for this x value at this position i uh, for the right half I'm getting seven bits on. Then my left half counterpart at this position i should have three bits on. So for that position i, you say okay p minus uh, the ZOR for that AI, right half AI, right? Um, so time complexity wise, will be so it'll be log of max n because you want to loop over all possible p's, right? Um, times the square root of max n because that's two to the fifteen, right? Which is two to the thirty, um, and then times n to actually a construct the bi's for each of these guys, um, and then also to like do the hash hashing and searching, right? So that in this case it comes out like uh, ten to the that's 100 million. I um, mean, that's nothing fast enough. Um, and so let's look at the code. Um, right, so oh yeah, another thing I should probably mention is that uh, in the code, I don't use a hash table. Um, funny story, when I first coded this like during the ed round, um, I did use a hash table and I spent a lot of time writing my own sort of hashing function and stuff and it got really annoying. Um, but uh, as it because I thought, because I did the exact same analysis that I did in the previous slide, I thought that Oh, okay, we need 10 to the 8. If I add an extra log factor, oh, that'll be like th uh, 30 billion, right? Or 3 billion, right? It'd be too slow. However, um, what I didn't realize in the edit, what the editorial had afterwards is that you can just, uh, when you're searching for in the hash map, right? In the, in the sort of, in the tree set, right? Tree map uh, for with a vector, 99 for like a, a vast majority of the time, uh, the comparison will get early. So if you have a 100 element array, you have this map of 100 element arrays, the tree map, and you're searching for it in it. Um, when it's at some node in, in the binary, balanced binary search tree, uh, as it's searching for it, it'll get cut off very, er, very early on. So when it compares these two vectors, right, of 100 elements, they'll, after the first three elements, almost certainly become, the comparison will be over, right? So instead of this hash being n here for this thing, it'll basically be replaced by um, a log, another log, log max n, um, which is about the same. So it's actually kind of, uh, it actually kind of faster than the hash solution that I had, which is interesting, I thought. Um, and this is, this, is, this is not me saying a wishy-washy saying that, oh, it's get cut off. Uh, um, it's just hopefully it's get cut off probabilistically. Um, since we're looping over all possible x values, we'll like actually be able to use a sort of randomized idea and be like, oh, it gets cut off. Uh, yeah. Whatever, whatever sort of expected value that probability gives us for however, however step it takes to get cut off, that the actual value will get because we're looping over the whole sort of event space, which is kind of nice. It's actually trying to be quite a bit faster than the hash table. Um, anyways, okay, back to the actual code. Um, we're gonna loop over all possible x left values for 10 to the 15th, up to the 15th. Um, and then we construct the array B for that, right? Construct this B array. Um, so how do we construct it? We just look at the left half, right? So uh, we take this value A and shift it. We just get rid of the right half by shifting it 15 times. And we store with x, and we see okay, how many bits are on it, how many one bits are on it, and I'm using the built-in pop count method for that. I mean, we and we store that in array, okay. Um, then we push that into our table, and we say okay, for the left half, uh, this array of pop counts corresponds to the this mask for x, this value for x, for the left half of x. Um, now we repeat for the right half, but as we do that, we're going to first loop over all possible values for p. Remember, p is the final bit count we want. We loop over all possible values for that. And then it, within that, we say, okay, now I'm going to loop over all possible uh, right half values. Okay. okay, we do that. And then for that, we construct the same B array. 
However, this beer is, is slightly different. So instead of looking at the left half of AI, we look at the right half. So look at the right half, what we do is we just sort of mask it, right? We don't want the left half. So we make this 2 to the 15th minus 1, which is just 1, 1, 1, 1 for the, for the bottom 15 bits, and 0 is all the way to the left. And then we ma use n to just hit those last 15 bits. Um, then we zor it with x, and we count the pop count. So be like, ah, this will, in this position, the pop count for the right half here is going to be the 7, as I said before, right? So then if p is 10, we want the left guide half to be. So we subtract that out. And we say, okay, so this q now will be what we want the left guide to have that will correspond to um, and then we see, okay, does that left guy that we want exist um, in our table? Uh, if it does, then we shift that left mask uh, to, by 15 bits to put it on the most significant side, and then we or it with this right mask that we have right now, right x value, we print that. Um, and if nothing works, and then we finish. If nothing works, uh, we just print negative 1 at the bottom. Okay? Um, any questions? Um, so I should like, mention uh, like nomenclature like uh, terminology. Uh, uh, for like when I'm when I'm implementing these these mean the middle problems, I usually like to prefer to use left to correspond to sort of most significant bits and or, uh, right to correspond to the least significant bits, right? Because uh, that's why we write like a binary number in, in English. Um, and then in that case, the left will correspond to the items with the greater indices. The right uh, sub mask of the in right half of the input will correspond to the uh, indices to the lower indices of the input. Um, and maybe that's backwards for you. And I think for a lot of other like uh, people I've seen like tutorials and stuff for me in the middle, code for me in the middle, other people sometimes do it the opposite way, um, where left half is the left indices and right is the right indices. And then for the bin mask, you'll look the opposite of what I would have it. And other people also like just use like sub, they, instead of using left and right, they use A and B. And then, like, and you'll see other terminology like that. Because uh, I guess I have no other questions. Let's move on. Um, okay. So, uh, now we're going to talk about uh, this is less of a code forces problem and more of a more general problem, um, which will come up as sort of a sub problem for a bunch of problems that you'll see, um, maybe. Um, it's called the discrete log problem. Okay, um, and so we're given two elements, uh, a a and b less than n, um, and we want to find some value x such that a to the x equals b mod n. Okay. Um, so this looks like a log, right? You're trying to find the exponent. That gives you some that makes this exponentiation true, right? You're solving for the exponent here. However, you're doing it mod n. You're doing it in this group of integers mod n, right? So Z n. Um, and so that's what sort of makes it discrete. That's, that's a discrete component to it, right? Um, there's no float or anything. You can't make x go float like the be for normal log, where you like. Um, but here you want some actual whole value, some value uh, that will actually make a to the b equals n when you mod by n at the end. Um, and this value might not exist depending on what n is and what a, what a is in relation to n. Um, so if it doesn't exist, just say it doesn't exist. But if it does, then you want to find some value that, that works. Um, this problem is very, very important in cryptography. Uh, all through our cryptography, uh, especially, uh, the most famous probably example of this is with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It comes up, I don't know. Something interesting you may want to Google. Um, so so it, in cryptography, the sort of uh, important part about discrete log is that it's very difficult, that it, you do have some sort of brute force solution. There's no polynomial time solution. You have to look at exponential time solution. Um, so what we want to do is sort of, sort of try to solve that for, um, sort of solve the discrete log problem for at least uh, bigger inputs than you could with just a naive brute force. So that's, that's where I mean the middle comes in. You want to see how, how, how big of a problem, how, how big of a input size can we solve the discrete log for. Again, the problem, the, see, the solution is not very obvious, so any observations would be nice. Yeah, build up to the answer. Isn't there, like, at some point, I forget the exact number, but at some point, A to the X repeats itself? 
I guess after end times, at least end times is going to start repeating. Uh, right, right, right. So it's it's after. So the exponents mod n go mod phi n. So if you look at the Euler Toshin function, right, um, a to that to a to that Toshin function of n will be one again. So I'll start repeating at that point. But a calculating Toshin function is not easy. It requires factorizing n. All right. Um, and b doesn't really help because take the example n is a prime, right? Then the Toshin function of a prime p is going to be p minus one. So you, I mean, you didn't save much at all in that case, right? And the primes are probably the most interesting case, by the way. If you're composite numbers, there's other things you can do, sort of reduce it down to a prime case, and so a polling Hellman thing algorithm where you can sort of uh, sort of factor it out and then reduce it now to the prime case, um, and sort of analyze that and build it back up. So um, this the case, algorithm we're going to cover now works for all cases, but the prime case is really the most interesting one. Yeah. I mean, in that case, couldn't you just like probabilistically check if n is a prime? Well, no, no, as I said, I, as I said, uh, be, I'm saying I'm just, even assume it's a prime. You don't have to assume it's a prime, but I'm saying even if you assume that it's a prime, right, um, that's sort of the worst case for you. Because then uh, the Toshin function thing doesn't help at all, because uh, the Toshin, the uh, phi of a prime is just p minus 1. So you haven't saved, your search space is 99% of the space, right? You haven't saved anything. How big can n be again? Uh, we're trying to find the fastest algorithm we can, but so yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, useful to take n to be I don't know, ten to the ten, ten to the ninth, something like that maybe. Yeah. Like CPs for CP uh, time limits, say take like ten to nine, ten to ten, ten to twelve, maybe even actually. Yeah. Maybe, not, maybe not ten to twelve, ten to ten. Yeah, so the, the critical point here is to figure out how you want to break up the, the input, basically, the input size into what, uh, like manageable chunks, or at least smaller chunks. Wait, so we assume that like n is, let's say, like 2 to the 256, and we have to break it into like smaller chunks well, to two, make it work. It just won't work for 2, two to the 256. Uh, this is, this it's still a brute force exponential solution. Okay. okay. It's, as we, but as we were doing for all the previous problems in this presentation, we just get like a sort of factor of two saving on the input side, right? Basically. Okay. It's, it's some like ha some some sense have the input. So. Anyway. So the, the actual discrete lag problem, actual Diffie Hellman, is safe when you have these two hundred fifty six inputs, right? Um, but if you have like a bad input that can be factorized or something, then we this sort of algorithm we're considering now can be applied. You make it dangerous. Yeah, David. Oh. Oh, he's like, oh, Microsoft. Sorry. No, I think um. I I don't really know how to do this, but like if you have a to the x and then that to the y, it's going to be equal to a to the x y. Um, and you can probably use that to your advantage. I'm not sure though, but. Yeah, that, that's that's actually part of the solution. Yeah. Okay.
think about how we broke up the input space in the last problem. Um, the, the sort of search space that the input gave us. Let's see if we can apply it here. Divide x and a half, maybe? Well, there's no x here. But... Right, right. Although there's an x, but you don't know the whole point, you don't know the x, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, I, I, again, I, I guess we didn't know x in the last problem either, right? So that's kind of maybe on the right track, but I guess be more clear on what you mean by dividing in half. Because that, that's the whole point I'm trying to get at. How, how are you going to divide in half? If you, you could like take how many, wait, would that work? You could take how many bytes n has and then divide it in half that way. And then it becomes like a, I don't know if that would work. So you're approximately at the right thing. Uh, Cause the thing you said about dividing the, the bits for n in like two, two, right? And looking yeah. at each one separately. What does that correspond to like mathematically? That's like a. So if you have x and y, where x is one no, half. No, no, I, I don't mean. I don't mean in terms of a. I mean literally, if you like look at some number n, right, and you're looking, you look at its bits and chop it in half, right. Approximately, what is that doing, like actually mathematically to to this piece of n? What do the piece of n become? Oh, it's the uh, the the remainder and the divisor of two to the whatever. Right. So maybe at a. Uh, Right, so I guess I'll say uh, we actually do in the end, right? We don't actually care about the bits here, unlike the last problem, right? The last problem, the bits were all that was important, right? Um, here, we're, what we're actually doing is we're trying to make just two sort of chunks of approximately equal size, right? Um, so when you cut the bits in half, what you're actually doing is taking the square root. Okay. Do you see why? So, wait, well, yeah, how do you how do you determine like? What this what chunks to split it up to though? Right, that's that's that, that's what I'm saying. Um, so, uh, if you anything you do with the actual bits, that's going to be sort of not exactly evenly cut, right? So if you have more bits to the left, less bits to the right for n, right? When you're cutting it up, that doesn't that doesn't give something an even split. But if you just cut it up into square root, right? So when I say square, so I mean I mean literally square root of n. So you 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 can think of like n being like two to the k, right? So as as Andrew was saying before, two to two fifty six. That's obviously way too big for us. But like I don't know, two to the forty, right? Um. So here, then, then one chunk will be two to the twenty, and the other chunk will also be two to twenty. So like, but n doesn't have to be a power of two. So in that case, it won't be like splitting up the bits literally, but you'll still be like taking the square root. When the yeah, square just, root, yeah, sorry, yeah. Wouldn't the square root be uh not like a whole number though? Some in some cases. Right, right, sure. But you try to even if you can. So you do like the ceiling of the square root. You try to get even. Oh, okay. right. yeah. yeah. So, so we, we cut into square root. That, that's the idea. Um, so yeah, let me just get, sort of start giving the answer. So we're gonna we're gonna look at we're gonna look at n and we're gonna take the square root of it, take the ceiling of the square root of it. Okay. Um, and then we're going to write x, um, similar to what David was saying before, I think, but maybe slightly different, I think. Um, write x as i times m plus j. Where i and m are both less than i and j are both less than n. So x is going to be in the full sort of x can be in the entire space search space of n, right? Um, but we can we can sort of split into two pieces that are each less than square root of n, i and j, um, and write i times m plus j. That 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 as we as i and j run through m, right, run through zero to m, uh, uh, i times m plus j equals x runs through the entirety of zero to n, right? Then the equation, instead of looking a to the x equals b, looks like a to the i m plus j equals b. Um, and then we can sort of split this up uh, into a to the i m times a to the j, and then divide by a to the i m. And, that, and then so we get a to the j equals b times a to the negative i m. Right? Um, then we can factor out the i on the right side. This is what they were saying before. Um, and then we get a to the j equals b, to the, b times a to the negative m to the i. Um, so then, so what we want to do now is we can look and we can be like, okay, um, I'm going to compute all uh, aj for j is zero to m, and then I'm going to sort in some sort of table, hash table, uh, 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 tree tree set, whatever, some sort of some sort of lookup table. Um, and then I'm going to 
do the same thing for the right side. So the left side here, right, are all the all the i values from i from zero to m, and it's a to the i. A, 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 sorry, a to the j's. All the j values from zero to m, and a, we look at j for for the left side. Now for the right side, we're gonna look at okay, I'm gonna loop i from zero to m, and we take this a to the negative m, a one, so one over a to the m, and then raise to the i. And then we're gonna multiply it times b. And then if this thing works, if this discrete log solution works, these two values have to be equal. So I'm gonna take this right value and then search for that equal to the left value um, in the table. And if if we do find something, but then we print out for the answer, we print out uh, i times m plus j as x. And if we never find anything, then we just print out negative one. Right? Uh, so the time complexity of this will be O M for this first first step. Um, plus uh, n over m for the second step. Or I guess like for the sort of yeah, for the second step, right? Uh, but here, here, uh, n and I, here they look the same because m and n over m were the same because I picked n to be square root of n, so it's just o square root of n for the entire thing. By the way, this algorithm is called the baby step giant step algorithm in cryptography. Um, any questions? I could do an That's example or something. Pretty op. Yeah, it is. And if anyone knows any like abstract algebra, this applies not just to mod n, but to any group. So uh, there was actually a problem on a five hour that we did where they wanted to find a discrete log in a permutation group, in a symmetric group. So with a permutation, you're trying to find what power to raise it to to get to the mod of permutation. So, and this exact same algorithm works. Um, Except n now just becomes the size of the, the, the whatever your other group that you have, not just like a, not just the mod, but like the size of whatever group you have. And the exact same algorithm works uh, for like the permutation. Oh, and by the way, one other thing I should mention for implementation is that here, when you're calculating this, right? Um, how do you check if it works or like doesn't work? So, so if you can't get the inverse of a, then you fail, basically, right? If a doesn't have an inverse um, in mod n, then you fail. But if it does, you take the inverse and you use your pow mod, your binary exponentiation, to count, take that one over a and raise that to the m. And then after that, that's all you need pow mod for binary exponentiation. Other than that, you just multiply sequentially. So you just, you start with one and then you multiply by i, multiply by sorry, multiply by uh, a again, multiply by a again, multiply by a again, and you get your how you get your a to j for all j. So you keep on multiplying sequentially and throwing that in your table. And then same thing over here, you start with b. And then you keep on multiplying by one over a to the m, which I've calculated with binary exponentiation. You just take that value and keep on multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. Start with b, multiply, search, multiply again, search, multiply again, search, and so on. Okay. This isn't exactly a question about this, but can you like have your numbers automatically be modded, mod something? Like I tried to do this with a structure and it compiled on my computer but it didn't compile on the code forces so uh yeah you can pop you should be able to do with the structure um the struct where you you need to basically define the operations for like time multiply add divide all those right um but it, it's you did it's probably like maybe hard to get right maybe if you i don't know some maybe I, I, I can take a look at your thing but there's also code forces blogs where people have done this where they define their own modular integer class or something where it just works. So you can maybe take a look at those and compare it. Or, or can, I can take a look at your compiler for the plus plus and see what's happening. Hey, Joe? Oh, yeah, I, I've seen it in people's codes. Like all the people on code forces who have like 300 line templates, they usually have something like that in there. Um, I can't remember anyone specifically though. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, even even with mine, like you always have to like do dot v to like actually get the value. Like I, I would, it would just be so cool if you could like somehow override um, long long multiplication just for a specific problem. You you can't override long long multiplication, but you can it can much look much cleaner by using like uh, constructors like implicit constructors. So and then like make your operators also work on like one one of your structs and then one of an L or. So it'll, it'll might you make it like look much much better and like feel much more like natural rather than having to keep on like calling functions or like, keep on constructing again and again.
and again, for like instead of pulling in the actual value and you print out an actual value, you can just like define an O stream operator on it, right? The left shift O stream, um, and then you you might not need to have a dot V. Right? Yeah, I see. Yeah, but one one thing that's annoying is like you can't override equals operators; it just removes the brackets. What do you mean? <laughs> you should be able to, right? For, for like, we, we, there's a, but the thing is, there's a bunch of different equals operators, right? There's a compare equals. There's the copy constructor. There's the R L L, L value reference copy. I mean, there's, there's the R value copy also. Yeah, okay, I, I, I need to investigate how to, how to like, do overriding because I was just kind of look, briefly looking over it to, to make this. Yeah, there's like a whole bunch of different types of constructors for like equal or like operators with equal things. You should, like, yeah. Okay, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, that's all for the presentation. Thanks for coming. Uh, and here's a link for the problem. Yeah, thank you. I don't think I, I don't have the third one on there. Oh, there was no third one. The third one is just free log. Okay, thanks for coming. Bye.